Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, What You Need to Know About CMMC. Our presenters today are David Driggers, Partner, How to GRC, Fernando Machado, Managing Principal and CISO, CyberSec Investments, Gary Cunningham, Director of Information Security at ECI Software Solutions, Fin Ling Yu, Product Marketer here at ECI, Darren Toy, Product Director at ECI, and Ryan Dobson, Professional Services Manager, also here at ECI. Before we begin, we would very much appreciate it if you would please complete the survey at the end of today's webinar, as your feedback helps us to continually improve our webinar experience. Now with that, we will start off with an introduction of today's panel. Fernando, please go ahead and start us off. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fernando Machado. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for CyberSec Investments. I'm a certified CMMC assessor and our organization is an authorized CMMC third-party assessment organization and we are located in Melbourne, Florida. David? Hey, my name is David Riggers. I'm a partner over at HDGRC. Uh, we do, uh, we provide advisory services uh, around federal compliance uh, for manufacturers and their supply chains. Gary, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gary Cunningham. I'm with ECI, as Evan mentioned earlier. I joined ECI about five months ago, uh, almost halfway through our journey to CMMC. Prior to joining ECI, I worked in IT security and compliance for 20 years uh, in a variety of tech firms. Next up, Finling Yu. Hi, I'm Finling. I'm the product marketer leading the CMMC and uh, ITAR initiative. So happy to work on a team with uh, these uh, really smart people, as well as uh, talk with uh, some of you in the audience. Next is Darren Toy. Thank you, Evan. Uh, so I am Darren Toy. I am a product manager for two of our ERPs within ECI. Uh, those two products are the M1 ERP and our MFG. ERP. Uh, I've actually been in ECI for uh, coming up for 21 years uh, and so um, know my way pretty reasonably well around uh, manufacturing companies uh, and their needs. Thank you, Evan. And lastly, Ryan Dobson. Hello, uh, Ryan Dobson. I have worked, uh, I work at ECI now, but prior to that I was a shop tech employee for 18 years. I've uh, consulted and managed the Job Boss Squared and MFG products. Uh, I also uh, manage the Job Boss consultants. Uh, so I uh, guess uh, similar to Darren, I've been around manufacturing a long time and uh, excited for these new new programs. Very good, thank you all. Fernando and uh, David, go ahead and take it away. Yep, so we're gonna talk about a little bit about the CMMC rulemaking timeline and then dig into the CMMC rule and review some of the comments made uh, during the public commenting period, as well as some of the responses and some of the rule highlights that you need to be aware of. Uh, so uh, on July 24th, uh, the DOD sent over the CMMC rule to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, or OIRA. These are the government regulators that have to review every single regulation. Uh, and then on November 17th, uh, OIRA concluded its review of all of the CMMC program documents. So these are going to be things like the CMMC assessment guides, the CMMC model overview, and the CMMC scoping guides. Um, OMB had up to 90 days to review the rule with a 130-day extension, and that was exercised. And on November 21st of this year, OMB concluded its review of the CMMC program, which then cleared the hurdle for the rule to get sent over to the Federal Register. And on December 26th, we had the CMMC rule uh, get published into the Federal Register. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, there's a 60-day public commenting period, so that timeline closes on February 26th. So if you have any comments to submit, I suggest you do so as soon as possible. 
Now, when it comes to the CMMC rule, there's going to be various comments and responses in the rule that we're going to go over, and then we're going to talk about some of the rule highlights uh, in the document. So back when CMMC started, there were several comments that were made under CMMC 1.0 that eventually led to 2.0, and DOD decided to carry it forward here. And one of the comments uh, was regarding joint ventures, and here they were asking on how joint ventures will be handled in respect to the DFAR 7821 clause, which is the CMMC rule. And DOD is basically saying here that the requirements are going to apply to the information systems that either process, store, or transmit FCI or CUI. Uh, and so pretty much what they're saying here is if it applies, if the information is on your system, then that's what it applies to that the joint venture companies are going to have to figure that out for themselves. Uh, David, did you want to touch on anything here? Yeah, I just wanted to to kind of point out that uh, it, it it's really interesting that DOD is casting a, a fairly wide net here for uh, for who's actually responsible or who's obligated to uh, to go down the CMMC path. Uh, initially, there were there was a lot of conversation about you know what's carve outs and and what's exempted, and what we're seeing from the DOD just based off of uh, what they're officially publishing is that 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 net's being cast fairly wide. Uh, so anywhere that FCI or CUI, the data types that are regulated by uh, by CMMC uh, or that are covered by CMMC, uh, anywhere where that data is located is is within scope so that's that's fair game um so it is it is kind of interesting that they they aren't making the exceptions that a lot of folks thought that they would be making uh initially yep yeah very good point uh next we're going to talk about fundamental research so uh within the defense industrial base there is a lot of organizations that do uh fundamental research uh, they have a contract with the DOD. Uh, these are typically universities that have contracts. And here the commenters had said that, you know, these higher education organizations would need to pull out of these research agreements because the, it would be too cost prohibitive for them. And the DOD's response is that the reason for CMMC is to provide that increased level of assurance that FCI and CUI is being protected. Uh, additionally, those requirements are only going to apply to the contractors that are handling FCI or CUI on information systems uh, that are processing, storing, or transmitting CUI. Uh, Dave, did you want to expand on this? Yeah, I think this just just uh, kind of reinforces the the, the previous point that, uh, that that net's being being cast pretty pretty far and wide. Yep, agreed. So, All right. Uh, yeah, and that, sorry, just 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 real quick. If that data is flowing into your environment through uh, through a a contract that you have, it doesn't even have to be a contract directly with the federal government. Uh, if you are in the supply chain at all, um, this is this is that, that that reinforcing that that far-reaching effect of 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 this rulemaking, and one of the reasons that it's it's been in review for so long. Uh, it, if you're deep in that supply chain and you have those data types with within your environment, you do have an obligation, a regulatory obligation to protect that data. Uh, and this again, just, just reinforces it. So we're, we're going to hear a lot of circling back on that uh, throughout the presentation. Yep. Agreed. And speaking of casting a wide net, the next section is on uh, international and foreign dip partners that are non U S contractors. And a lot of the, uh, public comments asked if international subcontractors of a U.S. prime will require CMMC certification. And the DOD's response is that they're all required to comply with all the terms and conditions of the contract um, pre-award with the CMMC requirements. And it holds true when that contract clause is flowed down to subcontractors. And the rule makes no distinction about which C3PAOs may assess which companies that are seeking certification. Uh, do you want to expand on this, Dave? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that that that's pretty straightforward. Um, it's 
they're going as far into the supply chain as as they can to put these minimum safeguards into place uh, for protecting CUI and, and SCI. So this is also touching those those foreign suppliers. Uh, as you guys know, the the DoD supply chain is 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 pretty deep um, and does cross international borders. Uh, this is not to be confused with with ITAR. Um, which is a, a separate subject. But uh, as far as CMMC is concerned, this is this is going as far into the supply chains as, as they can. Um, and foreign suppliers, which are usually a couple levels deep in the supply chain, uh, will also fall under, uh, under the mantle of, of requiring CMMC certification. Yep, agreed. Uh, the next topic, the next comment that was made uh, this is probably the number one comment if you ask anybody in the in the defense industrial base, and that is the comment on cost. Uh, multiple commenters commented on the cost impact of CMMC to small businesses, suggesting that it's too high to become and remain compliant. And DOD's response is that those costs attributed to this rule do not include costs with existing compliance with the FAR 52 clause, which is for the protection of FCI, or associated with, and the keyword here is implementing NIST 800-171 requirements in accordance with the DFAR 7012 clause. To the extent that defense contractors have already been awarded DOD contracts or subcontracts that include these clauses, the DOD is saying you should have already incurred those costs. Therefore, those costs are not attributed to this rule. And those costs are completely distinct from the costs associated with undergoing a CMMC assessment to verify implementation of those security requirements. I think one of the things that contractors kind of lose focus on is they believe that CMMC is a new set of requirements. All it is is simply a third party verification mechanism of your existing DFAR 7012 compliance. Uh, and I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Dave, to kind of touch on that some more if you like. Yeah, so just just going back for for the the mini history lesson, uh, the DoD has an expectation that uh, that all members of the supply chain, or at least all members of the supply chain that that have FCI or CUI within their environments, are already complying with the the regulatory requirements. So these regulatory requirements were in place for uh, many years prior to the CMMC program uh, uh, starting off. Um, so the CMMC program was spawned uh, due to uh, a lack of compliance with these regulations. So in the DOD's eyes, uh, and you can see it from, from the language in, in the rulemaking, there's an expectation that suppliers are already, already have uh, these, these controls implemented, these NIST 800-171 controls implemented. They see the CMMC program simply as third-party verification that those controls are in place. So just from the, the mindset of the DOD and the mindset of, of procurement at DOD, uh, again, that, that expectation is there that, that the supply chain is already within compliance. Uh, so that's, their, that's kind of their default out of the gate. Uh, and that's why the, the cost of, of complying here uh, was, was shot down so quickly by the DOD. Uh, as again, there's an expectation that if a contract is awarded, then the supplier uh, will already meet their uh, regulatory obligations that are on the book right now. Yep. Yeah, I think in the eyes of the DOD, they view that the only additional cost to all of this is the cost of your assessment, which is what they're um, levying. Uh, they don't foresee the cost of implementing your NIST 800 171 requirements, because as you can see here, they, they tell you that those costs are distinct from undergoing that assessment. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this particular response was actually in the DFARS interim rules back, uh, back in the day. Uh, and they basically copied and pasted it and moved it forward to today, right? And they've been saying the same thing for several years now. All right. Uh, in the rule, they talk about uh, disputes regarding CMMC assessments. Uh, some of the commenters, uh, you know, talked about, you know, what if there is you go through an assessment and you object to the initial findings of the C3PAO. 
Um, each C3PA, as a C3PA, I can tell you we're yeah we're all required to have a time-bound internal appeals process that is in line with the ISO 1720 standard. Um, and requests for those appeals will be reviewed and approved by individuals within the C3PO that weren't involved in the assessment at all. And if a dispute is still standing between the contractor and the uh, individuals within the C3PO that were not part of the assessment, the dispute will then get escalated over to the accreditation body who will then have the final decision. Uh, Dave? Nope, that's, uh, uh, I, I quite like the, the, the streamlining here. Um, so they're, they're, they're obviously building this up for, for volume, uh, to, to get as many organizations, uh, uh, certified as possible in the, uh, in the condensed timeline that they have. So again, this just, just reinforces that, it, <laughs> that steamroller's coming. Yeah. All righty. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to talk about um, communicating those CMMC requirements. So uh, a couple of the commenters requested that, hey, can you forewarn us of which solicitations and contracts are going to include CMMC requirements? And the DOD's response is, you'll be informed when one, the specification of the required CMMC level, and two, the occlusion of the appropriate DFARS provision clauses. However, there is no plan to advertise which solicitations and contracts will include CMMC requirements. Uh, simply put, it's gonna be a surprise when you find out uh, which contracts and solicitations are going to have CMMC requirements in them. Assessment delays. Uh, so commenters here are basically asking if an assessment is held up by a C3PAO or, you know, will the award be delayed until the results from an assessment are available? And the DOD said it doesn't provide any mitigations for assessment delays that may impact the timeliness of your certification or recertification. And that three-year period should be plenty of time to prepare for and schedule your assessment since those are within the control of the contractor. Regarding defense uh, contractor and subcontractor engagement, um, several commenters stated they wanted to be more involved in the rulemaking process, to which DOD responded saying they've held over 100 industry listening sessions in 2020. Uh, they made public posts about it in social media, news releases, and they've updated the CMMC Program Management Office website uh, in 2021. And all those FAQs have been brought up to date and so that is DOD's response to that is, we've been engaging you for the last several years. We've held over a hundred listening sessions. We've recorded all of these sessions. We put it on our website. So you can always go back and review those. All right, so now that we've gone through some of the, um, now that we've gone through some of the, the comments and responses by the DOD, here's a couple of, areas within the rule itself. So the first part of the rule is kind of considered the preamble. The second part of the rule is the actual rule itself, the actual regulation itself. So in subsection 170.3, here the DOD is planning to roll CMMC out into a phased approach. And the one that we're particularly interested in is phases one and two. So in phase one, we'll begin on the effective date of the DFAR 7021 clause, right? This is the rule that we're currently reading right now. And the DOD intends to include level one and level two self-assessments. However, keep in mind that the DOD can, at its discretion, include a CMMC level two certification assessment in place of a level two self-assessment. So if you're banking on a self-assessment, Put your eyes in, or excuse me, put your put yourself in the shoes of a contracting officer. What gives you a higher level of assurance, allowing an organization to self-assess or to go get a third-party certification? After phase one rolls out, six months later, we begin phase two. And at this point, you're going to start to see at a minimum CMMC level two certification assessments for all those applicable. DOD solicitations as a condition of contract award. 
All right. So in very limited circumstances, will they allow waivers? I know that's something that a lot of folks are thinking that there's going to be waivers out there for certain organizations. The key word here is in very limited circumstances. In the comment response section, the rule stated that there is no process for organizations to request a waiver of CMMC solicitation requirements. DOD internal policies and procedures and approval requirements will govern the process for DOD to waive the inclusion of the CMMC requirements in the solicitation. All right, and once again, right, a reminder that CMMC is not a set of new requirements, right? It is the verification of the implementation of your FAR 52 clause if you're handling federal contract information or NIST 800-171 if you're handling controlled and classified information. And I think, uh, uh, Fernando, just to, to, uh, to hammer home that point, uh, just as a, an, an FYI to everybody out there, uh, this doesn't only apply to uh, organizations. The, the the first level is is organizations that directly have a a contract with the federal government. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of manufacturing shops are nestled within the supply chain, so it might be two levels down, it might be three levels down. And where you'll start to see those requirements, if you don't directly have a contract with the federal government, is through contractual obligations uh, with your customers. So that's where we're starting to see quite a few uh, quite a few drivers of, of CMMC certification. So you might have seen this already in, in some of these contracts uh, where you'll get a requirement to demonstrate CMMC readiness or even provide certification uh, or to comply with the interim rule. So we're seeing a lot of this being captured. The, the DOD strategy is to really put a lot of pressure on those prime contractors uh, to ensure that their supply chains are in compliance. So again, you might not receive this directly from the DOD. You may not even have a contract directly with the DOD, but you will start getting pressure from uh, from those 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 prime suppliers uh, as as more pressure is being put on them. So it'll 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 literally flow down uh, through flow down requirements. Yeah, that's that that's a great point. I tell folks that that phased that phased approach applies to the contractors in which they have a direct contract with the government. But if you're a second or third tier supplier, that phased approach doesn't roll out doesn't really roll out to you. In that phased approach that they have on there, your prime contractor can say, "Hey, uh, now that CMMC is on the streets, go get certified." And so, please keep are. in mind. Go ahead. Oh yeah, no, and I, I, I was just going to say we're we're uh, all, a lot of the drivers on the advisory side and uh, Fernando on the on the voluntary assessment side, uh, folks that are essentially getting in line. Uh, the the main drivers for this are flow down requirements from from their customers, not not directly uh, from a solicitation to the federal government. So that's that's where we're seeing the majority of this driving. Um, as there's immense pressure on on those primes to comply, and they're they're taking a fairly conservative approach with their suppliers and pushing down those requirements so that there's no interruption to to business due to uh, uh, due to regulatory burden or uh, you know administrative issues. So we see a lot of these prime suppliers uh, being proactive on making sure that their their subcontractors their entire supply chains are are in compliance uh, or are on their way to compliance with target dates in order to make sure that there's no disruptions to to their business in delivering the contracts yep agreed all right uh in section uh subsection 170.17 uh, to achieve a level C a CMMC level two certification, here's what the contractor needs to do. Uh, you can receive a conditional certification or a final certification, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, the assessment results will be submitted into EMAS, which is going to eventually be connected to your SPRS and your CMMC level two certification has to be done every three years. 
Now, in standards of acceptance, here the DoD says um, a lot of folks in the commenting uh, in the comment and response were asking about, you know, what other frameworks can be met in order to achieve a C a CMMC uh, a certification. And one of the things here is right a DIPCAC high assessment. So if you are a contractor who went through a DCMA DIPCAC high assessment with no POAMS, then you can you're eligible for a CMMC level two final certification with a validity of three years from the date of the original DIPCAC high assessment. Uh, eligible if you undergo a joint surveillance assessment and you achieve a perfect score. Once the rule is final, your score will convert to a CMMC level two final certification as well. All right, when it comes to POAMs, you're allowed to have them if all of the following conditions are met. Uh, one, uh, your assessment score is 80% or higher so that you meet 88 out of the 110 controls. Uh, two, none of the security requirements can be higher than a one valued control. So no three and no five valued controls are allowed to be poemed. And additionally, these one valued controls cannot be poemed either. So when you actually total all of this up, it comes out to the 88 controls uh, in order to achieve that minimum threshold of 80% or higher. Uh, someone in the organization will need to affirm that compliance is continued and this is not a one and done deal. Uh, the affirming official will typically be a senior official of that organization that's responsible for ensuring CMMC compliance. And the senior official will need to include their name, title, and contact information as well as an affirmation statement attesting that all of the requirements are implemented and will be maintained throughout the duration of your certification life cycle. So I know uh, initially we had talked about in the previous section, we talked about the uh, joint surveillance. And so we're going to go ahead and talk about the joint surveillance voluntary assessment program. So the JSBA is a is essentially a DFAR 7012 assessment that's conducted jointly with an authorized CMMC third-party assessment organization and members of the Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity Assessment Center or DIBCAC team. These are the DOD's assess uh, assessors. Uh, when your assessment begins, the authorized C3PAO will conduct the NIST 800-171 portion of your assessment. Once that's completed, the DIBCAC team will pull the contractor aside and then conduct the DFAR 7012 portion of your assessment. At the end of your assessment, the DIPCAC team will go into the contractor's SPRS record and update it as a high confidence assessment. And Stacy Butschanek over at the CMMC PMO's office said that it's their intent if you get a joint sur surveillance certification today, when the rule becomes a thing, uh, your assessment will convert to a level two certification. Now, the difference between what she said here back in April of last year versus now that we, we what we read in the rule is that their intent was that if you go and you get a joint surveillance assessment back then, your three-year clock would not start until the finalization of CMMC. That didn't make it into the rule, but what did make it into the rule is that if you undergo a joint surveillance assessment and you pass that assessment, that you will get a CMMC level two certification upon rulemaking completion. Uh, you can find an authorized C3PAO on the Cyber AB marketplace. Um, so to, in order to be eligible for joint surveillance, you must have the two following criteria. One, you must have the DFAR 7012 clause in your contractual agreement. You can be either a prime contractor or a subcontractor. And two, most importantly, that you're actively handling covered defense information or CUI within the DOD. Uh, once you've selected an authorized C3PAO, uh, you will enter into an agreement with that authorized C3PAO. That C3PAO will then submit the contractor information to the Cyber AB. This is going to be things like your cage code, uh, your locations, uh, and what contract numbers you have with the DOD. The Cyber AB will then submit that information over to the DIBCAC team. And if the DIBCAC team determines that you are eligible for a joint surveillance assessment, 
they will reach out to the contractor directly to establish a scoping call and an assessment date. Once your scoping call is completed, during the first week, there's going to be a documentation request and review. This is where the C3PAO will request all of your policies, procedures, artifacts, and your system security plan. And they'll review all of your documentation in accordance with NIST 800-171. The following week, the authorized C3PAO will conduct the NIST 800-171 portion of your assessment. At the end of that assessment, like I said earlier, the DFARS 7012 clause will be conducted by the DCMA DIBCAC team. The areas that the DIBCAC team is going to want to validate are going to be things like, do you have a medium assurance certificate to report a cyber incident in accordance with paragraph C? Are you flowing down the DFAR 7012 clause in accordance with paragraph M if subcontract performance involves covered defense information? At the end of that assessment, that will be known what's called within the DOD as a high confidence assessment, which means it's an assessment that's conducted by the government that results in a high confidence level. The DIBCAC team will then go into your SPRS record about 30 days later, and they will update your score as a confidence high on-site assessment. Now, you're probably wondering why, how all of this CMMC and your DFARS compliance ties. And like myself and Dave said earlier, all CMMC does, it assesses the existing requirements in your DFARS 7012 clause. So in DFARS 7012, there's a section in there that states that the contractor shall implement NIST 800-171 no later than December 31st, 2017. DFARS 7019 says that the contractor shall post their 800-171 assessment into the SPRS system. DFAR 7020 says you shall provide access to your facility systems and personnel necessary for the government to conduct an 800-171 assessment. And the part that we're waiting for, tentatively estimated in the fall of this year, is that you shall have a current CMMC certificate at the CMMC level, uh, level required by the contract. Uh, with that, I am going to hand it off to Dave to talk about this section. Yeah, so uh, there's there's a lot of moving parts here, and the DoD has been investing in in the CMMC program for for years now. Uh, so there, uh, the the key takeaway here is that uh, the DoD isn't considering this as a a net new requirement. Uh, there's an expectation that contractors and subcontractors are currently in compliance. Uh, time is definitely not on your side. Uh, if if you're hesitating on on going down the the CMMC or NIST 800-171 journey, uh, the the key takeaways here are you need to start looking for partners and supply chain members. Uh, that that are taking CMMC compliance seriously. Uh, it's it's an overall process. It, it it's not just a single once and done. Uh, standing up a a full blown CMMC program, uh, especially for organizations who are on the lower end of the cybersecurity maturity scale, uh, is it can seem like a daunting task. Um, so it's very important to thoroughly vet partners. Uh, that that you're relying on, uh, especially your 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 key partners uh, that are that are managing your sensitive data or housing your sensitive data, uh, and just ask them how far along they are on their journey. Um, there are organizations like uh, ECI um, who we've been working with ECI for for a good long while now. Uh, ever since uh, uh, CMMC pretty much came up on the radar, uh, to put processes into place to ensure that uh, ensure that their customers uh, are uh, are compliant while using ECI products. Uh, the same thing goes for MSPs. So if if you are using an MSP, a managed service provider, uh, to manage your infrastructure, uh, just talk to them about what they're doing to, to get ready for CMMC. 
they should have a very clear messaging around it. Uh, again, this isn't this isn't something that you can just flip the switch on. Uh, most of these organizations uh, are either already living it, uh, or they have a plan in, of, of action in place uh, in order to implement and and support you uh, once once the rule goes live. Uh, if you're using in-house uh, IT, uh, make sure that they they they're familiar with the technical aspects of CMMC. Uh, NIST 800-171 has been around for a while. Uh, there's nothing preventing you from going out and performing a self-assessment or working with a partner uh, to come in and uh, give a set of eyes on there for for readiness. Uh, the the current ecosystem, and this is very important, the current ecosystem is at a very limited capacity. Uh, so if you take a look at the the amount of C3PAOs that are out there, uh, you can you can start to do the math and see that the longer that you wait, the the higher the demand for advisory and assessments is going to to be. Uh, so getting getting started now uh, and partnering with uh, with the trusted uh, C3PAO uh, is is incredibly important. Uh, if if you are hesitating on this um, and you believe that you do have CUI, FCI in your environment, so any sort of federal contract information or controlled unclassified information, you, you definitely need to get started now. And if you're already going down that process, uh, the recommendation that we have is to work with a partner so that you can get your program vetted. You wanna be ready on day one when this drops. Uh, Fernando mentioned earlier that uh, that there is a phased rollout, phase one and phase two. When you get to that point, it'll be it'll be too late to get started um, because that's that's a that's a hard blocker for uh, for those primes that actually have those requirements. There's no grace period that 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 flows in there. Uh, again, the expectation is that you are currently following uh, your regulatory obligations around CMMC. So yeah, the uh, the key takeaway here. Um, I mean, we've been we've been following the rulemaking process for <laughs> for years now, uh, and we've been working with uh, uh, with customers and partners to uh, to make sure that everybody's ready to go on day one. This is this is a big thing. It's it's not just infrastructure investments, uh, but it's also process changes, uh, and it's not a once and done. It's not only getting into compliance, but maintaining compliance long term. So one of the things that uh, uh, that we've been putting together, uh, as Fernando mentioned, uh, there are current members of the DIB out there that are doing voluntary uh, joint surveillance assessments. Uh, so what we've put together is a uh, an end-to-end an -end solution that covers documentation, advisory, and then assessments uh, to make the the process as streamlined as possible. Uh, instead of you know pulling in twelve different different pieces of the puzzle, uh, trying to provide a clean handover between uh, between the program build, the program run, uh, and the assessment, so that there's no confusion and no connecting dots along the way. But uh, yeah, time is definitely not on your side right now. Um, so if you haven't started uh then there is no better time than now to to get started on that journey thanks fernando yep yeah uh you know if you need to get a hold of me here's some of the uh services that we offer uh i actually wrote a book called cmmc simplified it's everything that you need to know about the fundamentals of the cmmc program in under 30 pages uh and here is dave's contact information for his help with advi uh, advisory and program build. And I think with that, uh, we'd hand it over back to Evan. Thank you, Fernando. Um, next, we're gonna have Gary Cunningham here at ECI jumping in to talk a little bit about ECI and CMMC. Thanks, Evan, and great job, Fernando and David. It's very informative. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of, of our journey to CMMC. Um, as a software provider, uh, we recognized that our products were being used by prime suppliers 
uh, or second or third tier suppliers to the government. So as a subcontractor to them, we wanted to position ourselves in compliance with CMMC uh, to support it. So we started about a year ago. Um, you know, the first thing we did was we recognized we've got to be in special operating environments. So we stood up uh, systems in both Amazon's GovCloud and Microsoft's Azure government cloud as well. And we installed our applications. Uh, M1 went into Azure and Job Bus Squared went into uh, the AWS environment. Uh, from there, we actually partnered with David and, and his organization to come in and help us walk through the process of doing the self-assessment and ensuring that all of our practices were aligned with the NIST uh, NIST guidelines. Um, we had security practices in place, but anytime you're going through a certification process, you know, one of the toughest pieces is making sure that you have the evidence to prove that you have uh, you know, your attestation of, of compliance. Uh, so that was a big key for us. Uh, we worked through that process over a few months with David. Um, and then by the end of last calendar year, we actually were able to upload our scores to the SPRS, um, log our poems, and then get our attestation of compliance with the interim rule uh, for CMMC in anticipation of the final ruling coming out in the future. So like I said, we had practices in place that, that were very well aligned with NIST. We just needed to do a lot of documentation work, making sure we had it. And then there were a few areas where we needed to make some improvements and we put those improvements into our pipeline. Um, and once the CMMC language is ratified, we will go through the process of working with a C3 PAO in this case, Fernando, uh, to get our final attestation to prove compliance of our environment in support of our customers who work for the government. Finley, did you want to add anything? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. No, you did such a great job, Gary. No, we're really excited to present this solution to you. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Great. Thank you. And Gary, thank you. Um, before we head to Q&A, um, Fernando, David, uh, Gary, anyone with any uh, closing comments before we start answering a couple of questions here? No, very good. Well, we will, very good, thank you. We will uh, jump right on in. So again, all questions for this webinar were submitted in advance. So any other questions that any of our customers here have, um, feel free to send them over and we'll be following up with you and we'll be getting those answered here following the webinar as well. So first up, um, question one is, we sell products to people who sell to the government and we do not have any direct contracts with the government. Do we need to show DFARS or CMMC to have an SSP or do a SPRS? I, I can answer that one. So it depends on, because CMMC is a data centric model. So if you are handling federal contract information, then you will have to meet the CMMC level one self-assessment. If you are handling controlled and classified information, then if you were to give that information to a subcontractor, you should have already flowed it down in accordance with the DFAR 7812 clause. Uh, additionally, if you have that DFAR 7812 clause and you are handling CUI, then you are going to be a target for CMMC certification in the future. And a lot of times that we see this is uh, usually for for job shops. Um, we see this in in uh, in specifications. Uh, so if you're manufacturing something on behalf of another company, uh, usually those specifications are CUI and end up flowing down, and that's how CUI ends up getting into your environment. So, like Fernando said, it's it, it's very important to identify and that's that's actually a really good question for uh for your customers uh when when you are in the sales process to to bring up whether there there are any regulatory requirements so is this is this being born out of a a ultimately a contract with with the dod more than likely that information will be cui when it's transferred down uh cui doesn't doesn't just mean uh, data in a database somewhere uh, it, it's, it's covered by things like schematics and uh, uh, machining instructions. 
as well as like training manuals. Um, and for bonus points, a lot of the CUI that you'll receive, especially as a second or third tier uh, uh, member of the supply chain, may not be marked. So it's it, it doesn't it, that doesn't absolve you from your obligations to protect that data. So in that case, it's a lot like HIPAA uh, with healthcare information. So even though it's not specifically marked as healthcare information, you have an obligation to protect it. And it's the same with, with CUI. So those probing questions during the sales cycle uh, are incredibly important to inform you of, of what exactly your protection obligations are around that data. Thank you both. Next question here. How long does it take to become CMMC compliant from start to finish? Yeah, that that really varies. But what what I've been seeing in the industry, and Dave, uh, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Kind of like let folks what you're seeing, but we typically see an eight to twelve month process to get ready from start to finish if they've done absolutely nothing. Yes. Um, so a, a year is 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 typically a good timeline. Uh, like Fernando said, we have seen accelerated instances where. Uh, maybe a small shop, and this is this is high on the list of priorities. Uh, seeing it rolled out in 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 a shorter time frame. Uh, the the big issues here, though, is is getting stakeholder buy-in. Uh, this needs to be high up on on the radar, um, and the proper arguments need to be made on what the risks are of of not being in compliance. Without having senior leadership buy-in. Uh, on on going down this path because there are changes uh, and if done improperly those changes can be disruptive to to the flow of business so it's it, it's very important to identify the risk early on and it really depends on on your level of, of risk tolerance uh, we we try to shoot for 12 months end to end so coming in greenfield building up policies and procedures implementing those policies and procedures and then generating the the evidence required for uh, for passing off to to assessments uh, that yeah 12 months is 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 a pretty solid time frame for it and this just reinforces how important it is to to get started on that journey as soon as possible yeah and to, and to touch on what Dave had said regarding getting um, stakeholder buy-in, is that they need to understand that this is not an IT problem. This is an organizational issue. There's a lot of physical, administrative, and technical considerations that have to be made across the board, and not one single piece can do it all. There is no silver bullet. There's a lot of considerations that have to be made. Uh, so just to kind of um, piggybacking off what Dave said. And that's one of the that's one of the things that uh, that was. Uh, that was really refreshing about working with uh, working with ECI. Um, the the model was there, so senior leadership was driving the adoption uh, of uh, of NIST 800-171 or CMMC compliance, which made the process much much easier. Uh, so very important to get that senior leadership buy-in. And a related question: How much does it cost to become CMMC compliant and certified? All right, so what I typically tell folks is from start to finish, if you've done absolutely nothing, all the way to the point of certification, be prepared to spend at least 100 grand total, because you're gonna have to purchase compliant products and services, because you just can't purchase just anything that's out there. Some stuff is banned, um, other stuff aren't. Uh, additionally, if you're gonna require help, uh, that's gonna come right at, a, your consultant is going to come at a cost. Uh, additionally, um, you know, purchasing different uh, products that are out there, helping you tailor your policies and procedures to what an assessor is going to be looking for. And then last but not least, undergoing the assessment. So we we typically say, you know, 100K is about the the right area, and that can fluctuate depending on availability. So if you wait until the last minute and everybody is booked up, then you're probably going to pay some premium prices, which is why myself and Dave are trying to kind of sound that alarm, get out there, get certified, get ready as soon as possible before uh, the, the DOD or your prime contractor comes knocking on your door. 
Yeah, and this is going back to uh, uh, something that, that that we touched on earlier is having that end-to-end -end solution. So we we've built up a process uh, that that carries you from end-to-end, -end, basically greenfield to uh, to certification uh, by building up a relationship with. Uh, uh, Compliance Forge, for instance, for the documentation. We've we've tested that documentation. We know it works. We've 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 actually implemented it live and had it verified with uh, with DIPCAC. Uh, same thing on the advisory side. So when we're putting processes into place, uh, the key that we're looking for there is let's let's go with something that's already been accepted by by DIPCAC. And then on the assessment side, uh, it's handing over that completed package to uh, to Fernando's team uh, to actually deliver the assessment. That's the reason for the entire process. So making sure that that process flows smoothly instead of trying to play connect the dots, that's a that's a huge cost saver. Uh, one of the most annoying things uh, I can I can probably speak to Fernando on this is uh, when Fernando's coming in to assess an organization. Uh, not being familiar with the material that's coming up. So that's just an added expense uh, that you're going to pay on the assessment side of them playing connect the dots. Uh, the same goes for uh, using suppliers that, that haven't gone down this path. So if you're, if you're reliant on, uh, on a supplier, uh, they should be able to provide you with the support that your assessors need uh, to actually deliver an assessment. So when we're working with ECI, uh, we've built up compliant processes, we have compliant policy in place, and those partners will end up, uh, you, you'll be relying on those partners pretty heavily uh, for actually attaining certification. So just make sure that that whoever you choose to help you on the journey, as well as the, the software that you have in place, uh, is supporting you on that journey. Um, that's, I, I, I really can't stress that enough as far as, as the cost savings side uh, in order to keep those that overhead as, as low as possible. So like Fernando said, uh, 100 grand is a lot of money. Um, on the other hand, it could be a whole lot more. Um, so it's, it, it's very important to choose the, the correct partners here that, that can support you on that journey. Thank you all. Next up, we have both ECI, M1, and Job Well Squared customers who are on our webinar today. Um, this question applies to, to both products, so I'd like to get one of our product experts for each um, to speak to this. Um, first, as an M1 customer, what should I be doing right now while CMMC is not yet released? And then um, afterwards, it'd be great to have someone speak to the same about job loss squared. Okay, so Evan, uh, this is Darren. Uh, I'll gladly take this. Um, so um, I think one of the most important things you actually need to do is to, funnily enough, reach out to one of our account managers. Um, getting in contact with us is actually a, a key step in this. Uh, what we need to do is understand on every single client what their unique circumstance is. Uh, this isn't necessarily a one size fits all. Um, the end solution is, but the journey to get there is always going to be slightly different. What we need to understand from every uh, M1 customer is, you know, what version are you on at the moment? If I presume that the question is from an on-premises client right now, first of all, we need to understand from uh, a migration perspective, what versions of M1 are you on? Um, what customizations might you have in place? What journey are you on to get onto the latest version? It won't surprise anybody when you're actually in our uh, cloud environments, you're always on the very latest versions. So therefore we need to make sure that when we migrate you, we get you to that point. In terms of your actual journey to CMMC, um, then again, what we need to do is we need to understand everybody's unique position, where they are in that cycle. That does mean of course that as you've heard today, we often will encourage people to take on specialist advice at the correct and appropriate time. Um, um, you know, this is exactly why we've got great people here like Fernando and um, uh, David on the call, and they've been instrumental to how we've gone about and actually created all of the um, appropriate solutions for us. 
So for every client, we need to treat them as a unique uh, case. So please, your starting position really is reach out to us, reach out for your account managers, and we can take you through the appropriate steps. Thank you, Darren. Ryan, anything to add on the job off squared side? I mean, it, it, it's mostly uh, a similar story. You know, you, you, you want to reach out to your account manager to uh, open, start the conversation, see where the gaps might be that, that we need to uh, overcome. You know, do we need to move you from on-premise to uh, cloud? Uh, things like that. So reach out to your account manager. Um, they will be able to help you moving forward. Uh, you'll also want to consider how you um, are going to want to do authentication, as which is one of the, the things that this requires and that's coming in, into the product. Um, you know, does everyone have the appropriate email addresses and, and unique IDs to be able to implement something like that? Uh, but that's that's about it. More of the same. Thank you, Darren and Ryan. We've got one last question here, and it's likely headed back to David and Fernando. Can you just revisit from earlier in the presentation and talk about the difference between level one and two CMMC? Yeah. So Fernando, CMMC you... level. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna touch on it. So CMMC level one is for federal contract information holders and right now based on the rule what we're seeing is it allows for companies to self-assess and level two is for cui holders in accordance with dfar 7012 and that will be your cmmc level two uh, um, assessment guide right which is the equivalent to the nist 800 171 requirements in your dfar 7012 contractual agreement Fernando, thank you. That is all of our questions here for today. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists here. Any closing comments from anyone uh, before we wrap up for the day? Very good. Well, in that case, I would very much like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And many thanks, of course, to our group of panelists joining us here today and sharing their expertise on this important topic. Please don't forget to complete that survey at the end of the webinar. Have a great rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you next time. Hey, thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks for having us.